Welcome back to Data Science for Everyone. We are at video three. Being a data scientist means thinking about how to turn things we care about in the world into data science questions that we can ask and answer. And we're going to dive into that over the next few videos. So what I want to talk to you about are two things. The first thing I want to assert to you is, uh, stay with me here, is that actually most people don't know what data is. We hear about data a lot. We talk about data a lot. But most of us have, I think, a misunderstanding of what data actually is. And one clue for that, to me, is if you do a Google image search, maybe by the time you're watching this, this has changed because the good news about what data actually is has gotten out there. But as of the recording today, if you do a Google image search for data, you get images like this. What is this? I don't know. It's blue lines and dots and numbers. And sometimes they form faces and sometimes they form like an exploding world and sometimes we hold them in our hands. And to me, this represents the fact that none of us know what data actually is. Or when we talk about data or when data is referred to or when we see ads for companies purporting to have some data magic that's going to do something amazing for us if only we give them our money, they're giving you images like this. And sure, we can turn data into images like this if we want to, but at the end of the day, Data is information, and there's a lot more that we can do with data if we actually go down a level and look at what it actually is, as opposed to an artist's rendering of how we think we can make data look extra cool. Data is cool, but not for these reasons. All right. So a lot of the misperceptions out there around data, or at least so I've heard from uh, my work with companies and my work as a professor working with students, is that we have preconceived ideas about what data is, and most of those, unfortunately, are not quite right. So some common views of data I observe out there in the world. Many people think of data automatically as a number, okay? Many people think of data as the cold, hard truth. What does the data say? It's in the data, so therefore it's irrefutable. More often than not, I hear people say a phrase that makes me die inside every single time, which is the idea that data is something that can speak for itself. Many fancy, important, influential, smart, thoughtful people have used this phrase, and I think it's very dangerous, and we'll talk about why in this video. So here's what I assert to you and what I hope many of you out there agree with me. Data can be a number, sure, but it can be words, it can be symbols, it can be pictures, it can be videos, data is information, right? We often do turn that information into a number in order to do things with it computationally, but we sometimes lose things when turning it into that number. More importantly and more usefully, let's think of data as information about the world that we've decided to collect in some form. A list of speeches from presidents in their inaugural addresses is data as much as a list of incomes among Manhattanites. Two equally interesting and important <laughs> pieces of information. The other thing I want to really emphasize, and we'll come back to this again and again, is that data is not the capital T truth. Data is an approximation or an indicator of something we care about. There is a cold, hard capital T truth out there in the world. I'm sitting here in front of my computer in my spaceship. There is a temperature outside. There is a level of precipitation outside. But I, the human, am choosing to turn that reality into information, into data. I'm turning how hot I think it is into a temperature. I'm turning precipitation into level of rainfall. Most importantly, data is something that humans interpret. Sure, if we're looking at a column of data and we see that the number of people living in a city has gone up over time, we're not making too much of a stretch or a controversial interpretation to say, oh, it's gone up, right? But it's up to us to say, hey, has the population gone up to a point that's interesting? Is it going up more than we thought it would? Is it going up less than we thought it would? Is it worth reporting on this in the first place? Should we contact the local news? Data is not saying anything. Data is simply a record of what happened based on how we decided to write that down, number of people in a city, then we humans are going to interpret it. All right, so going a little bit deeper on this. So data can be text, it can be numbers, it can be symbols, images, and so on. It's subjectively chosen as important or worth studying. If we have data on something, it's because we decided it was worth studying that thing. And it's something that we interpret relative to our existing hypotheses, whether formal or informal, stated or unstated, and our understanding of the imperfections of the data. In other words, data is not truth. Data is the result of humans turning truth into a piece of data. So for example, this is a flower, right? 
we could record some data about that flower. We might write down the number of petals. We might say what type of flower it is. We might identify the color. Those are all different pieces of data, different pieces of information we can collect to describe that flower. And there are tons more that I, as someone who doesn't know much more about flowers than this, and even this is pushing my uh, the limits of my knowledge, someone with more subject matter expertise could certainly flesh that out. We can also turn words into data. So in this particular case, and both of these examples come from the Data 8 Inferential Thinking course, we can turn a whole book into data sets. In this particular case, we've turned each little piece of data into the text from an entire chapter. Later, we can do other things with that data. If you're reading about or following any of the developments or even wondering about computer vision, here's an idea about how that works, right? We see a gray cat sitting looking solemn. We turn that gray cat into numbers so that the computer can do something with it. And we'll talk more about classification in coming videos. Finally, we all are actually turning the world into data all of the time, often without even realizing it. So this is a pain scale. There are things like this all over doctor's offices, hospitals, where doctors might ask you, how much pain are you in? And you'd say, oh, I'm uh, number three here. I'm the, the most pain and so on. And there are others where you could say, capture your emotions with different faces. What we're doing is we're turning something very complex and multidimensional, how much pain I'm in, how I'm feeling today. And I'm turning that into a piece of data. In this case, one of these smiley or not so smiley faces or my pain into a four. And we do it automatically. We often don't even realize that that's what we're doing. And most of all, because data is something that we interpret, we decide is worth looking at, we decide to make inferences from, we cannot say, what does the data say? So let's never, ever please say that phrase ever again. All right. And we're going to talk at length in coming videos about why data doesn't say anything even more than the intuition we built today. All right, I have a second assertion for you in this video. That assertion is that most people don't actually know what science is. Hmm, when we think of science or hypothetically do a Google image search for science, we tend to get things like this. We've got lab equipment, we've got microscopes, we've got tools, instruments, and so on. Fine, but that's unfortunately just a tiny part of science and we tend to overemphasize this part over the other really important parts that are out there. For example, when we think of scientists working in a lab, like these two excellent scientists, world famous, many people picture things like certainty and truth and correctness. We think of proving things. Scientists have proven this. We've proven that. It's all about getting answers and being correct. Scientists are seen as these know-it-alls who know everything and can tell you this, that, and the other interesting fact that's irrefutable that we should all trust and believe. A nice idea, overly simplistic, and frankly, misleading to the point where I think it's actually causing us more problems than helping us. Really, science is about doubt. It's about skepticism. It's about disproving our theories. We cannot prove a theory. We can only disprove our theories. And it's about asking questions and the humility that one study is an imperfect snapshot. If we think of scientists such as Walter White and Jesse Pinkman here, if you're familiar with this show, yes, they're scientists and they're absolutely in a lab, but they're actually doing all the things that are in this science is actually about portion. They are actually providing examples of doubt and skepticism. They're disproving their theories and they're asking questions. Can I make better meth than is already out there? Why is my meth blue? Is there something I should be doing different with my meth? He cooks over and over and over and over and over again, like any good scientist. You don't finish one study and say, aha, that's it forever. You refine and you refine and you refine and you're open to being wrong or improving. I'm not really going to reference a lot more uh, meth lab science, but, uh, but uh, catch me offline and we'll talk about it. All right. So data and science go together. And really all we're doing when we're doing data science is we're forming a theory, we're testing it with data, we're revising our theory, we're testing it with data and so on and so on and so on. We tend to get dazzled by the data part of data science and we tend to forget the science part. And I really wanna emphasize that the science part, the thinking, the reasoning, the asking, the hypothesizing, the tentatively concluding and thinking about how confident we can be in our answers, that's just as important as doing cool, interesting things with our data sets. So science is in fact driven by theory and the theory is an idea about how things go together. So when you're looking at a data set, you are working with a theory even if you don't realize it. So to give one teeny tiny example that's almost certainly problematic, let's consider the case where, hey, I wanna understand crime in my city. So 
My theory might be I have some pre-existing ideas about crime and I am interested in, in finding out if it's getting better or getting worse in my hometown. And that's not really a theory in the formal sense, but just the idea that I am interested in crime will call a starting point. I'll do my observational study. I'll say, huh, I observed data that says, hey, crime is going down in my city. Okay. Then I'm going to say, well, why would that be? Well, here's a theory. One theory is maybe it's because of access to education in my city. Well, if that's the case, then I would need data on education. So, okay, I'm going to collect data on how much education everyone's getting. I'm going to combine that with crime data, and I'm going to see what the relationship is. And suppose I find a relationship consistent with my theory, more education is associated with less crime. And then I'll say, well, okay, well, why would that be? What is it about education that's reducing crime? Well, I wonder if crime is going down because education increases employment. And then I might collect employment data, analyze crime, education, employment, et cetera. So when we're thinking like a scientist, we're using the scientific method to understand causal relationships. This means having persistence in trying to disprove findings, humility about our biases and limitations in our research, knowing that we cannot prove a theory, only disprove it. We talked about the scientific method in a previous video. I want to briefly review it right here because it's that important, and I promise you it's more fun than it sounds. We are going to observe. I see something in the world. Wow, how interesting. Question, why? Why is that happening? Maybe it's because of this thing. Oh, if I'm right, then here are the patterns I should see. Then I evaluate the data, conduct my statistical analysis, I update my theory, and then I repeat and continue with new data, new hypotheses, and so on. Again, data only plays a role in a few of these steps, not all of them. To summarize the scientific method, it's thinking really hard, getting out into the lab or into our spreadsheet or into our pandas data frame and mucking around and, and running some tests and then thinking again, why did I see those results? Did I study what I thought I was actually studying? Is this data any good? How could I do better? and getting back to the lab again and again and again. And if you are um, would prefer an example not uh, including a meth lab, you know, a human scientist who's not making uh, illegal drugs, or if you're a data scientist, that laboratory part is likely to be in front of your computer. All right, last words for this video. Why can't we prove theories? Well, all scientific work is tentative. We conduct any particular study at a particular time and a particular place. And then we use that evidence from that study, that study that's a little snapshot of the world, and this is evidence we use to evaluate the plausibility of our theory. If my theory is correct, what should I see in the world? If I find evidence consistent with my theory, I would say I have failed to disprove my theory. I would not say I have proved my theory. Now, why not? The reason is because we have no idea if the next study we do might actually disprove our theory. We don't know. It could be that we've done the same study or similar enough studies or asked questions of the same theory a hundred times. We don't know if the hundred and first time we'll find some evidence that's different from our theory. That's where that scientific humility comes in. We have to be humble. We have to know that we can't possibly ever exhaustively test a theory. Therefore, we cannot prove it. Not with data. Mathematically, sure. But with data, we can never prove a theory. We can only disprove or fail to disprove. All good theories can be disproven. And we need to have theories that can be disproven. If they can't be disproven, they're not scientific theories. But no theory of any kind can ever be proven. If someone is claiming that science has proved something, do not listen to that person. Alert. All right. Finally, Causality is going to be a big focus for us. So causality is the holy grail of science. If you don't know what a holy grail is, it's an elusive object or goal that is sought after for its great significance. Thinking like a scientist almost always means using the scientific method to better understand causal relationships. And really, a lot of questions we ask about the world are fundamentally questions of causality. Causality itself is very difficult to determine observationally. It's almost impossible to pin down except in the most specific experiments. Most of the time when we're working with data, we're working with what we call observational data, meaning we looked at the world and wrote down some of what was happening. We didn't actually assign a treatment and a control like we might for a drug trial. And so we really are just looking for observable implications of our theory. I said that causality is at the core of most things we care about. Here are some examples. So things I care about, things you might care about. Why do some people get cancer and not other people? Basically, we're asking what causes cancer. 
What makes two countries more likely to go to war? This is something I studied a lot in grad school. What causes war? Why might a person experience depression? What causes mental health or a lack thereof? How could we eradicate malaria? What is causing infection? What makes one basketball team better than another? What are the causes of success? Or a question like, how can we predict which startups will succeed? Which is effectively also a question of what causes success. We can make each of these questions even more specific. But my point is that even if we're not stating causality, we're almost always looking for it. So what do we do? We care about causality. How do we use data science to maybe better understand it? We follow the scientific method as closely as we can to get to causality. We keep refining our theory. We zoom into those causal mechanisms to keep improving it. And maybe we say, okay, I've disproven my theory uh, uh, so much that I really think I need to move on from this theory to another theory. And we'll talk about a little bit in this course, controlled randomized experiments, but we don't really, we're not really going to do that in this course. But really what we're going to do is we're going to drill down and try to get into the causal mechanism. Ooh, causal mechanism. <laughs>